to me, that is a very poor showing. Over 20 years to really, really 20 years, you're going to add 100 co-ops, uh, given that the U.S. population has, you know, itself uh, increased by, I don't know, 85 million or whatever. Um, that shows me that as I think it's it's conclusive that the cooperative movement as a whole has failed. I am here with Yohai Gal from the Boston Tech Collective. We're actually just called Tech Collective now. Just oh, just Tech Collective, no more. Yeah, we we have we have because we have three locations now, so we just go with Tech Collective. Um, so yeah, uh, Yohai is just going to share with us some of his thoughts on the how the worker co-op movement has been um, for the last couple of couple of decades. So uh, yeah, why don't you just start off by telling us uh, kind of about your history in the movement and a little bit about the uh, Tech Collective. Uh, sure. So uh, my name is Yohai. I have been involved in worker co-ops since 2006, uh, probably a little bit before then, but the co-op, I didn't like, I, I consider my involvement to begin when I called uh, Dave Carolee, the original founder of the Network of Bay Area Worker Cooperatives, which is a kind of peer group in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, I called Dave Carolee in early 2006 just to ask advice about starting a worker co-op. And um, my uh, uh, co-op journey started <laughs> at that point. Um, I was interested in co-ops long before my family were kibbutzniks uh, in Israel. and. Um, I actually found a piece by Tim Hewitt of the R.S. Mendy cooperatives um, uh, that he had written many years. I mean, I was I'm 41 now and I read it when I was like 17. So uh, that was really what triggered it for me. This this specific piece that he wrote called a cooperative manifesto that really um, kind of galvanized my interest in work cooperatives, uh, uh, tech collective, which is where I work uh currently and also the cooperative that I helped found um, came out of an idea where I had some uh, background in IT and tech support for um, organizations that I already worked for. Uh, I'm, I myself am a high school dropout. I didn't go to college. I did work at a chain of youth hostels in the San Francisco Bay, Bay Area. And after a couple of years, kind of started putting my uh, cobbled together tech knowledge to use and made them a sort of plan where they could hire me and be, uh, uh, I could be their IT guy. So, so it kind of started with that. But then after um, a while of doing that, I ended up thinking, Hey, I I could do this kind of on my own or as a cooperative. And um, that eventually led me to uh, start tech collective, which uh, we were at the time about six members and uh, we didn't have any money. I borrowed 500 bucks from a former coworker and uh, was used that to pay for our rent in San Francisco. Uh, that's $500 from Sven. I still think what, about it. Um, what were you renting for $500 in San Francisco? <laughs> uh, it, 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 well, so again, this was 2007 and office right. commercial real estate in the, what is now called um, the outer mission Uh in an office building that no longer exists uh, on uh, 21st and mission, there was this building that had a um, really like labyrinthine series of um, uh, halls led to a really shitty, small, tiny office that um, we were able to rent from. And it was $500 a month. Um, and they only required uh, the down payment. I think there was some reason why we were able to do it, but anyhow, we were able to pay them back right away. Uh, my, me, and some of the other people who we started with walked door to door, just handing out homemade business cards I had printed on my uh, dad's printer because my father um, he repairs copy machines, so he had like lots of printers at his house. So we had printed out these cards, and we had gone door to door, and we made enough from um, the existing cooperative network in the Bay Area to actually help us continue after that first month. Um, eventually, a few of us did go to Wells Fargo, where one of our members is um, uh, Guy Billy. Uh, his his sister worked at this Wells Fargo, and 
was willing to give some of us a um, $14,000 line of credit, um, which we used. I didn't have good enough credit to actually be on the on the loan at the time. Um, and we did pay that off. It took us a couple of years, but we did pay it off. And we used that money to pay ourselves salaries. Um, it did. We did get rejected from about 20 banks before. I mean, we really tried, including co uh, credit unions. Everybody rejected us. Yeah. Uh, you know, the most progressive seeming bank, whatever, all rejected us because um, all of us, myself included, um, are immigrants or were immigrants, are immigrants, I guess we both are. And um, we had people from uh, China, Vietnam, um, mm -hmm. uh, Finland, uh, Sri Lanka, and um, we all had trouble getting, <laughs> no surprise, getting money. But eventually, Bill, Billy, who was from China, his sister worked at Wells Fargo and, and made it happen for us. And um, yeah, I don't know what we would have done without that. Um, we did pay it off and we got no loans. Uh, I worked there for five and a half years. And then when my now wife uh, wanted to move back to her home state or her home, the New, New England, which is where she lives, where we live now, um, uh, I came with her. So uh, we moved to the East Coast and um, I just got any old IT job. Um, I worked at a healthcare analytics company for about a year and a half and then left to start another tech collective. Um, the second tech collective, which was all called at the time called Boston Tech Collective. Um, now all of them are just called Tech Collective. But, um, it was called Boston Tech Collective at the time. And um, it uh, was the same deal. I just put an ad on Craigslist. Uh, I didn't actually say how I found my original people. I worked at a computer company called Central Computers in San Francisco. And within six months, I left with uh, five of their uh, other employees. So I, we all right. just left together. So I, 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 well, I showed up and blew it up. Yeah, it was uh, from a business <laughs> perspective, it was kind of a shitty thing to do. But uh, whatever. Hey, there, hey, hey, there's all fair in love and war and business there, is, you know, like, it's like war. So <laughs> there's they're still their company still thriving. So, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. but in Sam, in Boston, I took a different tack. I posted on Craigslist and I also, um, uh, when we formed, there was uh, initially, again, there were six of us in the end. We had about 13 people interested and it. Whitt it whittled itself down after a few months to only about six. Um, mm -hmm. We got a loan from the Cooperative Fund of the Northeast, which is a regional uh, funder of cooperatives that provides loans um, as lines of credit, essentially. At the time, they still required line, um, a personal guarantee. They don't anymore, but we all signed personal guarantees. Um, I was able to show them the books from San Francisco and they were you know, impressed enough to say, okay, well you did this already. We're going to, you know, we're willing to move ahead with this. So they gave us a line of credit of $70,000. And um, I, I think at the time in San Francisco, when I originally had started, there wasn't really anything like CFNE. There was like the North country development fund or whatever it's called. And then there was the, um, there was some other stuff, but none of it was regional for sure. Now there's a bunch of resources available for people in my situation, but the CFNE is still my one of my favorites. Um, they truly are radical and do amazing work. They've never defaulted on a loan, or they've never had a lendee default on a loan. Um, they do everything they can to try to make cooperatives succeed of all types, housing, worker, whatever. Um, and their current executive director, Micha, is he's an old school union guy, totally gets it, and is. Um, they're everyone who works there is amazing. They're also clients of ours to this day. So, um, like we manage all their it and, and they're a great, great organization. So I can't speak more highly, in, um, around CF &E. Uh, so that was huge for us because it, the let the loan allowed us to actually pay for our employees for the first six months. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we originally had a, so in San Francisco, our business model was we had a storefront where people could walk in. We actually had three total cause we kept moving. We had a storefront where people could walk in, we could do repairs, data recovery, but we also sent uh, technicians, people's homes and businesses, uh, that has persisted or that persisted up until around 2012 or 13. And then the kind of market for, uh, laptop and desktop repair just collapsed that it became a non starter. Uh, we did try it in San, in, in Boston as well, but after a couple of years, it was clear that that was a, um, bad business model 
you know, so we focused entirely on business, which is also what San Francisco did. We were in, independent from San Francisco um, during this entire time. We still had a good relationship with them. We had like shared a Slack instance. We shared email. We would do kind of technician swaps, but we didn't really um, uh, join our businesses as they were kind of autonomous self and kind of like se separate entities. Um, but we both kind of arrived at the same conclusion business is where it's at. It's the only way to like pay people what they deserve. Home is a kind of a nightmare. People, it's a huge time suck and it doesn't make you any money. So like home tech is just not really worth it. Um, yeah. in the long, in the long run, both of those businesses, which still exist today, obviously, um, ended up focusing on business, which is great for employees and it's great for the client. Um, meanwhile, through the, uh, my, my personal interactions via the Federation conferences, I made contact with, um, two people, uh, Jeff Bright and, uh, actually I did, I, maybe I should ask their permission before, but I made, I made, um, well, Jeff, I know he's fine with it cause he wrote a thing for geo as well, but, um, there was someone else who didn't, I didn't ask uh, their permission yet. So I made a uh, contact with two people from, uh, this other cooperative that did the same thing as we did, but was based in Louisiana. And that was called, uh, C4 tech and design C4 is was the oldest um it cooperative in the country that does the kind of work that we do um we're not like websites right we we do uh outsourced it for organizations and there are a couple of us in the us now maybe five total six i don't know but they were the first i mean uh they were started by jeff who's um uh a long time kind of anarchist like myself uh he started c4 in I don't even know. It was like almost maybe the year 2000 or something. It was a long time ago before yeah. we started. Um, and he and I met through the Federation and I met some of his colleagues as well. And we immediately connected and realized, yo, we got to start working together. Uh, so we started up these technician swap programs where they would send someone to stay with us for a week and we would send someone to stay with them for a week. And we would kind of just learn what the other organizations are doing. And then we'd bring that back and we adapt and try to, gain some advantage in the market from what we learned from their expertise and vice versa. We did that for many years, back and forth, back and forth. And um, all the while we would kind of joke about, hey, why are we even competing? We should just be one company. We should just be one company. Um, and about three years ago, or maybe, maybe slightly longer, uh, we started to talk about maybe really doing it. Um, we were in talks uh, initially to form a more generic uh purchasing cooperative called the tech co-op federation uh, which we did form and we did have other co-ops in as members throughout its tenure but eventually it didn't really serve its purpose because we were kind of we felt like we'd be better suited just being one company uh, the two major players in the tcf which was mm -hmm. um c4 and tech collective and so, yeah, that's what we did. So we are now officially one company. We have been working together as one company for almost two years, but we've been officially one company since January. We, like legally speaking, um, C4 Tech and Design, it only exists on paper. There are no, it has no employees. Um, they were sep very different than us. They were organized. They had a, a two autonomous departments, one that did web development and one that did the kind of work we do. Um, and we made the deal, the kind of merger with the entire company, but the web department um, was involved, but they were kind of insulated from a lot of it since they just kind of did their own thing. Um, now that's all gone. We're all one company. Um, I get the privilege and occasional irritability to work with Jeff every single day. Like literally we talk multiple times a day now because we are, we, we help, we work, we go on sales calls together. We, you know, we help each other with projects. I mean, um, we got out of that um, a bunch of great technicians and they got our business model, which um, not trying to malign them at all, but we had reached a very good point in our business where we were able to um, pay employees what they deserve and get good returns and all that. So they all had their wages essentially doubled from the merger and we wow. got our staff doubled. So it was a really good trade-off for us. And um, you're and you're now all over the country, right? You've got right. people in San Francisco and Boston on the East Coast. That's right. Well, we have before, yeah, so. we have people in a few places that we have um one of our, our sales lead is in Sacramento. Um I live in western Massachusetts now, as does mm -hmm. actually one person from the New Orleans branch 
<laughs> lives here and we have a few others here and then we have folks in new hampshire and boston and um uh we're actually now we're finally positioned to actually officially do the same thing with the san francisco branch which i started so long ago um mm -hmm. the my very first hire there is kind of now the only he's like the longest member there he's basically my analog there he um he, he's just kind of waiting on us to get our ducks in a row so we can have the same formal arrangement as uh as 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 we did with c4 and i i got to go out to the c4 branch it was awesome you know to meet my coworkers in person and and um we all you know communicate on slack every day we use um software to vote together um we were organized somewhat differently uh we're a lot more top down than they were and i can explain what that means um we weren't always that way i think we were for a long time a lot more flat and after um, I got to go to Mondragon in 2019, I came back with a lot of ideas, big surprise. And um, I worked with my colleagues to implement some of those ideas. And the current structure that we have is the result of that. And it existed prior to our merger, but they kind of agreed to adjust to our structure because it had been so successful for us while still implementing a lot of kind of... Um, um, niceties, especially around cultural stuff and, um, procedural, um, uh, they're a lot, they're a lot more organized, even though they were set up as a flat semi-autonomous, you know, <laughs> kind of anarchist commune or whatever, but, um, they are really into accountability and into procedure. We were into structure more than anything. Um, and I'll explain how we're structured if that, if that's okay, it might be. Yeah. 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 Relevant. Yeah. Please do. I just gotta, I, I, I just gotta throw in that, it, you know, when you get to know, uh, organizations, long time existing organizations mm -hmm. that have been set up by anarchists, they're always way more rules and checklists and things. Yeah. Than you they gotta think. be, <laughs> you, you know, gotta, naively. You gotta be. Yeah. No, as Jeff, as Jeff likes to say, you must structure your policies around the worst possible person. <laughs> you know, because the, you, what you yep. have to think about what the worst person would do. Um, exactly. So our structure is as follows. Um, we essentially have a, uh, the, so the membership is the ultimate authority, but the membership appoints a board of, uh, a, a um, uh, sorry, this is a little internal joke here about what we call these people, but we have, we have a sort of management council that is made up of members. Um, currently it has three members. So let's say you have um, 10 worker owners, three of those people from that body would be elected to sit on this management committee, this governing council, whatever you want to call it. Um, th this is the only committee in the entire organization. Everything else is called a team. And I'll explain what that means. So the, the management committee or the, the elder council, we have many internal jokes. Um, the management committee are, it rotates out. We have an election process, et cetera. I won't go too into details about that, but um, basically it's appointed from the membership itself. They have the highest authority before the entire membership. They have a given amount of delegated authority. Their job is to think about big picture stuff to deal with issues that can't be dealt with by anyone who um, uh, might throw that up to them. So let's say that there's a problem a member has a problem. They have a, a, a given uh, procedure for following up with that issue. If, if they're ever in doubt about the procedure, they can go to the management committee. However, there is also one more kind of layer beneath that. The management committee appoints team leads, which are not elected positions. They are appointed by the management committee itself to uh, lead the teams that uh, are responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of the organization. So for instance, I am the uh, projects team lead. So there's a team called projects and um, it does projects as you can imagine. My job is to make sure everyone else is doing their job and to make the final decision around a lot of projects related tasks. If there is a question that I have that I don't know the answer to, I then go to the management committee. I could, of course, as a member, always go to the entire membership, but the whole point of the management committee is to save the entire membership from having to deal with the nitty gritty about stuff like that. Like, I, you know, do I, um, as a project's lead, really need to weigh in on a accounting finance team question that relates to W9s with clients? Like, I, I, I might, and as a member, I have every right to ask about it and to give my opinion, but realistically, I'm just trying to do my job. Um, 
Again, these positions are permanent until removed. So I, I've been the project's team lead for a while now. If I wanted to, I could step down, but the, the management committee appoints the team leads and keeps them in check. Um, they also, uh, to some degree, make sure the team leads are fulfilling their own responsibilities. So if I, for instance, I'm not doing a good job, the management committee's responsibility is to make me do a good job. That might be because <laughs> through having... Um, like an HR inquest where they ask the HR people to come in and talk to me, or we, we have a personnel committee that we create that's ad hoc that might be brought in if it's a personnel issue or whatever. There's a lot of things that could happen that they have at their disposal. But um, again, the order here would be members on top, management committee, team leads, and then team members. Um, accounting has a special place. They're, they're not able to override management decision, uh, management committee decisions, but they are able to come out and say, yeah, this is, we are against this. This is not a good idea. Um, or we do not recommend this at this time. You know, right. uh, in theory, the management committee is there to also ensure that the overall procedures that every team is responsible for are being handled. They're, you know, as the project's team lead, I am not in a position with my day to day to go and see if the sales lead is doing their job. I, unless, of course, I'm on the sales team, then maybe I can go and say, hey, I feel like this isn't working out. I can talk to my team lead directly, or I can go to the management committee and talk to them, or I can talk to the, ma the membership as a whole. I always have the option of doing that as a member. But in terms of streamlining our day to day, the structure mm -hmm. really helps us stay in check. Because when we came back, um, to the table to try to build this new system, we've tried to answer two questions. Who is responsible for what and who makes decisions about what? Here is what I have found after 20 years of this work. If it's not someone's responsibility, there's a chance no one will do it. And and so let's say, let's say what we used to do when we were more flat. Hey, a new client came in. They're an annoying client. Yeah, they make us money, but they're annoying. Whose responsibility is, is it to deal with them? All of us would just try to like find ways out of it because nobody wants to deal with it. But the minute you say it is now X person's responsibility to delegate that task or to do that task, all that goes away. The questions go away. It helps new people. And it also helps us stay true to our own mission, which is, you know, to provide a healthy and happy and successful workplace to our membership. Um, so really structure helps us a lot. The, the C4 folks had their own way of achieving, achieving a lot of those similar goals and you'll have to ask them i know that jeff had mentioned wanting to talk to you as well you might mm -hmm. you could ask him for his perspective on how this has worked for them being a lot less um flat than they were used to but um to their credit they accepted our structure because they saw that as a business we had done so well um that it just made sense to try to see if maybe our way was the better way um and honestly the truth is a synthesis will be the better way but um right. Uh, we've learned a lot from them as well, especially around procedure and accountability. We had kind of just a lot of accountability for us was internalized. And then if someone left that all a black hole would get created, you know, and, and so um, they've helped us with procedures and documentation, which is what they're really good at. Um, and we're not competing with them. So it makes sense. And in fact, we used to trade work back and forth. So now it's like, Actually, now all their clients are our clients and their clients are paying more because we charge more and their employees are making more money and we're making, uh, well, we're, I guess we're just doing twice as good, but we're still playing. It doesn't matter. We're, we're doing well. Um, not to mention people are still getting their, um, you know, we, prior to the merger, we were all ba being paid in my opinion, very well for what I see in other cooperatives as well as we also, we still got good patronage. We still got um, really great. I mean, we have, we have unlimited vacation. We have great benefits. Like it's really great to work here. And, and we built that, you know, it wasn't always good. We had hard times there. There was time where we didn't get paid for months because of a couple bad decisions and economic downturn and shitty things happening. That was no one's fault. And we were able to get through that because as a cooperative, we could kind of minimize those externalities. And now I'm happy to say it's been years of just healthy, happy um, uh, financial growth. And yeah, there are there are things that we need to do better, but I'm very optimistic uh, compared to where we were before. And we're finally in a position now where I can come back to San Francisco Tech Collective, the original, and we are saying, hey, 
okay, we figured out how this merger thing worked. So far, it's been almost a year of actual merging, almost two years of working together, and it's working great. Here's what we figured out. Now it's your turn to get on board. And then maybe if somebody else, not Tech Collective, wanted to do that too, maybe we could do that as well. You know, Because for us, it's only been a benefit. And, and one more thing I wanted to add, um, the idea to actually do it, I remember now Jeff from C4 had been doing a technician swap in Boston. He was staying with me. And he was spending a week just coming to, you know, shadowing me at clients, whatever. And we, after hours, we went to go see um, uh, Dave Hammer from the ICA group give a talk at this union meet about co-ops um, because he's really in a democratic ESOPs and such. And um, ICA, also one of our customers. And um, he was talking about how scalability will beat good intentions every time. He was talking about like the evergreen co-ops and like how, you know, they were struggling to do, to be as, as as inexpensive as some of their competitors who had scaled. And that's, I remember after the fact, sitting on my porch, drinking beers with Jeff and we both were like, what are we doing? Let's just scale with each other. Let's just figure a way out to do this. And, and that led to the TCF, which eventually led to uh, there being a uh, tech collective now, you know, own, absorbing um c4 techs workers and and clients and so yeah so that's the current current story of tech collective i now have a much more um backstage role at my organization um i i do like kind of high level technician stuff and i have a lot of project stuff but most of my job honestly is weighing in on issues that other team leads or the management committee are asking for my experience for which i find um I guess it's like kind of nice, it, you know, I've been here doing this for a long time, but I also feel like even though, you know, things aren't perfect, there's internal tensions or whatever. Um, I think the level of mutual respect amongst all of us has really gone up. And um, I think that has to do with just being successful. I think really like it's a <laughs> lot easier to be happy when everyone's making money. Um, yeah. And, and so I, I think a lot of times people miss, they like look at their business like, oh, why are we all in his throats? It's like maybe because you guys are paying yourselves shit or, or, you know, why can't we pay ourselves anything? Maybe because you only work with nonprofits and you only work with like radical organizations. Like maybe you should act like a business and not just focus on saving the world, but focus on your workers first, which is, which was for us, the turning point was recognizing that we still operate in a very capitalist marketplace. We are still competing with all these other organizations, if I am paying someone the same as they make, um, if they were a first year out of college with no experience, uh, and they've been doing it for 30 years, they're just not going to work for me. And yeah. you see all these organizations in particular web co-ops who all pay the same. And I just don't think that that works at scale or with every business. If you can make it work for you, great, but that's not how it works for us. I am the highest paid person in our organization. Um, yeah. And actually, no, Jeff and I are now paid the same, but um, I, that's how it was up until the merger. Because I, why would I, I can't, my level of experience is very high. I, if we just hired someone, there's no way for me to make less and him to make more and it to somehow work out. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I, that's why we yeah. couldn't hire anybody for a long time. It's because people won't work for pennies. And mm -hmm. I think I remember being at the left forum in 2007, I want to say in New York, and I was moderating a panel of tech co-ops, every single tech co-op there, except for mine, which wasn't on the panel was basically said, Oh, we get severely undervalued. Oh, we don't make enough money. And all of them were choosy about their clients. And I, I think that that's, there's a, there's a connection there. I think if you're not charging enough and you're not getting enough income from a wide variety of clients, you're not going to be able to pay yourselves what you deserve. And if you're all paying yourselves the same, you're going to continue to struggle even more to find good people, unless you're all doing the same relative work, but we're not. We're not, we have different scales right. and expertise and yada, yada. So, um, uh, just try to, you know, we still have a, a, a ratio of one to six for highest and lowest paid, but, um, mm. I just don't think it's realistic to pay everyone the same. And I think that's a mistake a lot of co-ops make when they're starting out. Yeah. I mean, there are some notable examples of, uh, you know, flat pay scales like the Arismendi, uh, co-op specifically, mm -hmm. um, the, but they're all doing the same work. It's in a bakery right, doing all the, right. and I'm saying that's all exactly. fine. So but I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, you I know, think it, it's very highly, de yeah, dependent. And obviously. Also, you know, did they go to college for it? It's like, it's like, yeah. Right. Now we, most of us did not go to college or didn't go to college for mm -hmm. this kind of work. 
but it still requires decades of specific experience doing specific work. And if you just go and look at what people pay for the same job at a very similar company, if we're paying significantly below that or not yeah. at least op offering some compensation, it's not worth it. You know? Yeah, you can't expect people to sacrifice really their like seriously like life prospects because you know for the sake of the cause or whatever. Um, you know, well, that's like, what people do though. That and that's if I'm interviewing well, someone, they, they that's do the that, red but flag. you know, until somebody gets sick and you've got a huge medical bill to pay or something, and it's like I right. can't work that, for the co-op right. anymore, and then right. they have no, to go and work that's for what happens. Google or whoever, Precisely. right? And so we yeah, lose everything. Right, right. I mean, that's so, exactly yeah, no, that's exactly the problem. Um, and it's it's and I, all too common. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I've definitely, because of the kind of work that I've done, which is a lot of healthcare and a lot of like food service and a lot of construction and stuff like that. Um I've been, you know, a pretty strong advocate of, of flat wages for a lot of those type of co-ops. But yeah, it's certainly it, it, like anything with co-ops. There's no one right answer for everybody. Right, right, right. And you need right. To be Just as there's no right and realistic yeah. about, yeah, right. what, yeah, yeah, what you're doing. Um, that would, yeah, that is really great. And thanks for the all the information about your, um, you know, combining with C4. Uh, it really sounds like a, a symbiotic situation reminds me of you know mitochondria <laughs> you know, yeah it yeah used to I be mean, their own thing and now we you know right. everybody everybody benefits when uh, yeah yeah and I, it, it was that and it did it i'm mean, not gonna say it was easy when we spent first off we both came at it with our own expectations of how this company would be would look like and you know how much would we change how much would we keep how much would they bring over and and there was a lot of conversations, as you can expect. And we met on a regular basis. Just we had um, people from both co-ops would just meet. And eventually mm -hmm. we came up with a kind of like, uh, look, until we merge, let's see how we work together. So we came up with a contract where basically they worked for us and they would give us some of their clients and was this kind of in-between thing. And then after a year of doing that, we said, okay. Let's make it official. And then we brought over all the rest of them. And and now it's, it's you know, I, looking back, it seems so quaint, but now it's like, I can't imagine it any other way. I mean, I work with all these people that I, I talk to every day now that I never did before. And I'm dealing with clients in Louisiana. I'm dealing with clients, you know, here. And it's just like, it doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't, it just, it feels, mm -hmm. it feels the same to me, which is why, you know, we're lucky that we work in technology and that the kind of work we do is mostly done remote. Um, uh, so, so in many ways, we just leverage the existing technology that we already were using to make a cooperative bigger than just ourselves. And, and I'm really proud of everything we've done to get to this point. I mean, it, it, it I'll tell you, it, I was a tiny part of it, but we did it collectively. And it, there was a couple of people who put in a lot of time to just make everyone tr somewhat happy. Thank God we're not consensus. That's all I can say. I would have been <laughs> a lot, I would have made things a lot more complicated. Um, yeah, again, no, no one right solution. There's yeah. no panaceas out there. So mm -hmm. you've got to work with who you've got, um, and what works for you with who you've got. So I would like to, um, you know, talk to you now, get your, uh, your thoughts on, um, on the U S Federation specifically this year is the 20th anniversary of the founding. Um, we're trying to, you know, do a kind of a, a retrospective on where we've been and where we've come. And uh, I think your response to our survey that we sent around was actually the first one that was overtly critical, I'll say, of the uh, of the Federation. Um, not the only one, but the first one. <laughs> and um, so uh, I'll just um, I'll just read here, uh, you know, something you wrote and see if I can get you to just expand on it a little bit. Um, you say, as for the national platform, I see the USFWC as an abject failure. They have done a few good things with respect to healthcare and national legislation, but their emphasis on technical support, particularly at conventions and educational initiatives do nothing to combat the overall issue with worker co-ops. People simply don't know they are an option or how to do them. Um, so would you, do you want to expand on that at all? Sure. I mean, there's two aspects of it, right? The first is mm -hmm. why I think it's an abject failure. And the second is why I think it's so important that people know what co-ops are. Um, as I said in that, uh, I don't know, in the letter, whatever you want to call it. Uh, when I started this career, um, 
there were roughly 300 worker co-ops in the U.S. Um, and now there are 400-ish, depending on who you talk to. Um, to me, that is a very poor showing. Over 20 years to really, really 20 years, you're going to add 100 co-ops, uh, given that the U.S. population has you know, itself uh, increased by, I don't know, 85 million or whatever. Um, that shows me that as I think it's it's conclusive that the cooperative movement as a whole has failed. Um, I don't think it's about baby steps. I don't think we have time for baby steps. And I don't think that um, a 2% growth rate is indicative of success. Uh, I also think that the fact that the Federation itself, which is our preliminary body on a national stage, um, has over time moved more and more away from its at least what my understanding of its core goals, which was to support the creation of worker cooperatives and um, uh, it, and its member bodies and their members. Um, I don't see that as being, um, uh, that success in that area being evident. I, I want to just briefly explain what I meant by, um, I don't know what you, what you said exactly, but I was talking about um, uh, basically it's how at conferences, there's a lot of like educational workshops and that sort of thing. Um, the right. breaking point for me, so I, our co-op, which is now a member of the Federation for the first time in over, I think a decade because C4 was a member. And when they joined, we agreed, I, I abstained from the vote, but we had a vote to stay in membership. And I said, I'll abstain. I don't want to, you know, push this issue now, but we'll be back to this next year. Um, so we voted to join the Federation. Once again, we sent two people to the Federation um, uh, this year. And um, my understanding is people were surprised to see us. Uh, it had been a while since uh, Tech Collective. We sent one one woman from Tech Collective and one woman from C4, so um, who had been a member of, of uh, the Federation before. So I think there was uh, maybe a little bit of, of, of uh, interest around that. Uh, my last interaction with, I guess you could call it the Federation, uh, is at the Eastern Conference for Workplace Democracy in um, 2017, maybe? Yeah. Um, in Worcester, Massachusetts. Uh, I went there. And as I sat in their um, convention hall and leafed through the convention um, uh, guide, the printed guide for what's being um what's going on at the convention, I noticed something that was kind of bothering me. I noticed that over 75% of the seminars were being run by people who don't work at worker cooperatives, technical specialists, outsiders, etc. cetera. Um, and then later I was having a conversation with someone who I'm not going to name, um, who did, uh, whose recent success at converting the largest worker cooperative in uh, I think it's the largest work cooperative conversion of all time, but it's definitely the largest in the state of Maine where it is. Um, this person had helped convert from three capitalist businesses to one single worker co-op, had spent years doing it. And I mentioned to them this kind of like kind of question I'd had, why are all these, you know, technical specialists running the show? And um, we were talking about it and they said, well, um, you know, that's why I don't, bring anyone down from this uh, cooperative in Maine. And, and, and I said, what do you mean? And they said, well, they just wouldn't understand any of this. They're just, they're, they, they, to them, they're, they're living day to day through worker cooperative ownership. They're largely uneducated. They're all basically poor white folk from Maine who live on an Island. Uh, um, they, they're currently still getting a handle on, you know, how to run a business, how to do things democratically. And all this talk that we have about oppression dynamics and about, um, I'm, I'm not, well, you know, I'm, even, I'm not even going to disparage too much. Just go look at any federation conference plenary, and it's uh, the vast majority does not relate to operating a business. It relates to intersectional social and power structures that are very important, but are not the core issue. The core issue is running a fucking business as a worker cooperative. And most of these plenaries, I, I don't want to read a, a textbook on proto-feminist Marxist ideology just to be able to get some ideas on how to, you know, balance my, my QuickBooks or something. I, I just, that doesn't appeal to me. Yeah. Now, I say this as an anarcho-communist, you know, I, 
I have the same interests in those things. I I'm very invested in uprooting and overthrowing white supremacy and oppressive power dynamics in all aspects of life. Does that mean that's what I want when I go to a conference? No. Is that what regular people want? My answer is no. I think that the Federation as a whole has done what all nonprofit grant cycle funded orgs have done in the past 20 or 30 years has moved on to um, this entirely separate ideology that only serves to serve to kind of um, uh, fulfill what I consider as sidelong achievements, not sidelong in the grand scale, but sidelong in terms of creating a cooperative economy. And I think you can see that very clearly by the lack of working class white people in uh, the Federation's membership, as well as at any cooperatives period. You, you, yes, tons of white people, almost all of them educated from college backgrounds, tons of people of color, many of them working class. But the reality is that there are more working class white people in the United States than the entire population of African-Americans the entire population. So when we are doing what all leftists do and um, infight and focus on secondary issues and forget that there is this core issue of overthrowing capitalism that is pushing the cooperative movement forward, uh, we become disconnected from, I think, a realistic chance of succeeding. And for me, I spend a lot of time with white people who are not progressive. And they don't understand any of this. But if you explain what a cooperative is, if you talk to them about the day to day, they don't get threatened. It doesn't undo their, you know, strict father morality. It doesn't make them think it's communism. They they don't see it that way. And we're in my opinion, we are missing out on a major revolutionary body that is just completely obscured uh, as part of the larger strategy. And that's only one half of my criticism of the Federation as a whole is that they have fallen prey to the same kind of um, progressive trap that we all fall into, which is let's try to fix everything and let's do it in such a way that it obscures the actual um, uh, people out there that would directly benefit from this and help us further our own movement. You can go and try to transform all the urban areas you want. The reality is there is this mass, mass of people that are, un for, for whatever it's worth, are working class white folk who live in the Midwest and in rural areas that have no idea what this is. And those are the people who get people like Trump elected. Those are the people who are constantly fighting against their own interests, who are who are breaking with unions, you know, which are like 3% of the public sector, our private sector now. And to me, we're missing those people. They could be part of this movement. And, and they're not. And our focus mm. has been, I believe you can still focus on the other things, but it has to be more balanced. And so, again, I think we need a different approach when it comes to um, uh, the movement in the long run. And that's, again, that's only half of it. The other half of it, I, I can't state this any better than the article that um, was, you know, <laughs> hilariously posted after I wrote this by uh, Rebecca Campbell about how basically the Federation has fallen prey to this classic power dynamic, which she doesn't directly um, say it's because of the executive director and their relationship to the board, but that's absolutely what this is about. Um, I can't speak intelligently on the internal politics of the Federation because I have been outside of it for too long, but reading her piece on geo, which is a godsend. I really appreciate that you guys exist and that this kind of work is coming out of here. She is one of my heroes. She's been doing work for years, just on the side. She's just on the side, just doing her thing. And meanwhile, building some of the best cooperative movements we have in the Madison area and also on a national stage with this kind of thinking. And I urge anyone listening to this to go and listen to, or go and read or listen <laughs> to Rebecca's piece from October, uh, sorry, from August uh, 19th, 2024, about how um, the US Federation itself has basically changed to a from from a member supported body to a nonprofit supported body and that they did this for many reasons but that over time it's gotten um pretty far from its initial goal uh and mm -hmm. i i could not agree more i think she says that better than i ever could and she does touch a little bit on what i 
believe I, I just said about how we've kind of lost focus because we've started to laser focus on what all leftist and nonprofit groups are focused on right now, which is uh, intersectional oppression dynamics. And those are important things, but they're also kind of distracting when they're the dominant thing you have at a federation conference, which is nominally uh, about worker cooperatives and being a worker and being part of a solidarity movement of workers. Um, I didn't look at the plenary for this year, but I looked at last year's federation plenary and it is exactly what I um, would expect mm -hmm. or the last one, I should say two years ago. Um, that's so, yeah, so that's my opinion. I think the Federation has failed. And I think that the U.S. Federation, or should say the U.S. cooperative movement is uh, in shambles. And it, I am very pessimistic about its future. Hmm. Um, yeah, so I mean, there's definitely lots of plenty of problematic stuff that Rebecca brought up. And, um, you know, one of the things that you also mentioned in your uh, you know response to our survey that we published on the website is uh the funding of the federation is only now 10% coming from members, 90% less than that. From yeah. Less than She's, 10%. Yeah, she so, said it's 6% or so, something like that. Right. Her, her 6.8%. So it was founded. The idea, of course, is you have a member led, member directed national organization. Um, and in order for that to be real, of course, we also have to fund it. Uh, in the beginning of the Federation, that was difficult to do. Um, and so what ended up happening was, you know, going going to that good old foundation well. And, you know, it may have been uh, a reasonable thing to do, a justifiable thing to do at the time. But obviously how it's it's gone now where it's 90 percent, the funding is coming from people who are not worker cooperators. Uh you have you know, he who calls the or pays the piper calls the tune right you have to wonder like and, and so that was one thing that i i didn't know it had gotten that out of hand until rebecca uh, wrote that and and provided the the receipts as it were um the other two you know thing that i've you know i'm glad that people are finally you know discussing a little bit is what seems to be a real lack of accountability at the federation and I think probably Dawi as well, and just our organizations maybe generally. Um, but, you know, when the Democracy at Work Network was rolled up and 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 discarded without any consultation right. with the members of that right. network, and then when the due sharing agreement between the regional uh, networks and the U.S. Federation, that policy was changed unilaterally without apparent yes. notice or input right. from the board at all those both things like there needs like what is the process i mean yeah clearly the thing is the process is clearly not being followed not if they there. have one because if there is and, one and, it's not being followed yeah. right yeah and this is i don't know why people i mean I, again i haven't been involved um since the current ed took over um my understanding is that um he runs the show and that the board is sort of secondary which is to me, kind of crazy because in a cooperative organization of any kind, even if you're trying to be a cooperative organization when you're actually being a nonprofit, um, which I know the Federation is not a nonprofit, but Dawi is, uh, the the board should be in charge. And, and if they're either too afraid to push back because of um, power dynamics, which is kind of what Rebecca touches on. She talks about how essentially people through charisma and through um, act at what they, what she called them people who have who are active players um in an organizational role those people can overstay their welcome and forget kind of who is in charge um it, it's funny to me because you read about revolutionary movements over the past hundred years and they're always like this we're always like rediscovering that this happens like no that this is why Leninists are bad. Like this is because there you, you can't, you have these revolutionary body that talks about like how there's, well, you, you need a few people who are really engaged. And it's like, no, no. The point of leaders is to make more leaders. The minute leaders exist just for themselves, you end up getting situations like what we're describing. And, and as she said, it's, it's hard work. You have to work hard to create accountability in your own structures. And, um, all of us are guilty of these kinds of like mini capitalists, as she calls them. But I, uh, I, yeah, from the outside, again, 
someone who has not been in a, I, literally that Eastern Conference workplace democracy thing happened. Some other stuff happened too, but that was kind of the last round. I just thought, you know, what am I getting from this? What am I getting from this? You know, I, I'm not supposed to, you know, we, we also in the same, that same trip, by the way, one of my colleagues, who's the son of Portuguese immigrants, who was a worker at, um, he was a working class guy, very working class family are electricians. He was an electrician, worked for us. He went to the ECWD and he was told by someone during a meeting that he would not be allowed to speak because he was white. He was told that in one of these kind of like anti-oppression workshops. And he just walked out. He just walked out at that point. And mm -hmm. look, I understand their attempts to underline a lot of white dudes talking. But for this guy, that's he's not going to understand that. It's like when you come at Trump advocates and give them a line of 13 bullet points why Trump is bad. They don't. That's not how they think. That's not how it. You need to approach people from where they are. And and it was that incident and also another incident that happened on a local level with an affiliate to the Federation that made us just, you know, we're just, mm. this is not working for us. And I, I, I think that that's, that kind of ideology coupled with power dynamics is a recipe for disaster, which is why we are where we are today. Um, I'm sure there's more to it, but that's my impression. I'll tell you one more story that pissed me off. Um, when I was, so I, I, for a long time, didn't have any money and we were not doing well financially during this particularly bad downturn before we had shifted our business model. And for years, our policy had been, we will do our best to pay for the newest member of a co-op to go to a, a conference. It's what we always did, which means I just never got to go. I went to the first couple and then I just didn't go again. And I really wanted to go to this, to the one that was in Chicago, not this one, but the previous time I was in Chicago. <laughs> and I applied for a um, uh, scholarship. What's it? Scholarship. Thank you. Um, and they did, they declined me, which is fine. We paid for our person to go. I was just extra. I couldn't afford it on my own. Um, uh, the person that we sent told me that someone at the Federation who was responsible for declining scholarships or not, that he had engaged with them and that she had told him, and this is a person very high up within the Federation and Dawi and it still is, had told him, ah, uh, we don't need to give you high money. He'll always be around. You know, we need to give money to, you know, someone from Alabama who will never come here. And my response to that was like, no, fuck you. I'm not always going to be around. Like I've started multiple co-ops. I've worked my ass off. I'm not asking for a handout. If you don't want to give me, that's fine. But don't assume I'm always going to be around. Like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and to me, that level of like we're disrespecting worker cooperatives who actually work hard to get what we're getting who put everything in the line because i don't come from alabama like dude i i just can't understand that. and that to me cauterized my relationship there that was it just done yeah i'm just done you know this whole like political people are better or worse than each other for it no f that i'm out um and uh that again it's, this is all personal but i just felt like the federation had focused solely on achieving its ideological ends, which were in my mind, divergent from the overall goal of worker cooperative solidarity. Um, and I also think the the proof is in the pudding. I, where are the co-ops people? I, you right. know, I re I, I do uh pro bono I mean, consulting to help, to help co-ops get started. And um, I always ask people how many cooperatives show of hands do you think are in the U S even people who don't know what cooperatives are, cannot believe that there are so few in the U S Sorry, mm -hmm. continue. I, I didn't mean to cut you off there. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, 100 over 20 years, we've got 100. That's five a year. Come on, five yeah, a year. But populate, <laughs> but yeah, and then given population growth right. uh, oh, at, that, yeah, exactly. at, no. at that rate, yeah. It also, Being by the way, does, yeah. do, doesn't it count for how many of these are startups that don't go anywhere? How many are anchor institutions? I just, and mm -hmm. how many are actually worker cooperatives? Now, I'm not going to be one of those, like, right. you know, Rebecca's a little harder than I am about ESOPs. You can have democratic ESOPs. There are many ways mm -hmm. to do this. But there are also like King Arthur Flower is not a worker cooperative. It should not be counted. You know, they're cool, but they're not organized democratically. They just have a stock options. And I don't yeah. I do think that we need to make a distinction between democratic ESOPs and just a traditional ESOP, even if they are 100 percent employee owned. I think being a worker cooperative is not just one member, one vote. It's not just equity. It's also the way you do your job and how you are participating in the overall decision making at an organization. Um, and I think we're a little too I think we're too liberal with that our terminology and yeah. and that's not anyone's fault the u.s government just kind of pretends we don't exist so i'm not yeah. surprised 
Um, I, I wanted to add just to kind of back up what you were saying about the uh, kind of the ascendance of, um, you know, the, the you know the intersectional uh, politics and stuff like that uh, uh, over and above any kind of like uh, practical uh, business uh, stuff. Uh, one of our our members who um, is currently living in India, but Malakia Johnson, she wrote about this uh, several years ago, actually her first article she wrote for us uh, was about um, a NASCO conference that she attended. So different organization, but um, you know, she- and They're a funding member of the Federation, are they not? Yes, um, as, as, as are we. Um, but yeah, she, so she was at this uh, NASCO conference and she, as she writes in the article, um, a couple of uh, black gentlemen from I think Philadelphia, they're working class guys, you know, not college educated, I assume. Um, and they were, and this was long enough ago that the term people of color was still kind of a new thing. And they were, one hadn't heard it before and two objected to the concept of like lumping them in with a whole bunch of other people, like the Koreans yes. who own the, you know, right, all the right. stores in the neighborhood or whatnot. Yeah. And th they were just, you know, saying this, just talking like, Oh, what? And they proceeded, she said, you know, to get a lecture <clears throat> from a couple of young women there about patriarchy and something, <laughs> something, you know, that, and, and she's like, yeah. And those guys, like they're gone. Like, they're not coming yes. back to any co-op stuff. Yes. And I've, you know, I've got, you know, uh, s several, you know, friends who are, uh, come from very poor backgrounds um, and, you know, live in Montana, which is a very white state. And so, you know, and they've shown up in leftist spaces and tried and gotten, you know, a lot of the same thing. And it's a huge, a huge turnoff, um, you know, just- And it's, 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 it's so, unfortunate. It's so we're, losing, yeah. it, right. we're losing the ability to like, you know, get these people in, even if they do have some regressive ideas about certain things, like they're not going to change their mind by us starting with that. Start by like helping them right. build a business. And then maybe if right. you find out, oh, they have some uh, off ideas about immigrants. Well, when you talk to them about it, they're going to maybe listen to you a little bit more. When, yeah. Know. And I mean, I'm not even looking at just like convincing people. I'm talking about nuts and bolts strategies for developing worker cooperatives. I just don't oh, yeah. see the Federation as being useful. Honestly, the most useful way to start a work cooperative is to go to either the ICA group's website and look at their resources page or the uh, 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 SBA has like a small page. You know, it's like, but the Federation is not who I think of. Um, right. And it used to be to some degree, Dawn was somewhat helpful with that, um, but that's mm -hmm. no more. Um, right. And so I, I just, I don't, I, and, and this is actually a larger problem. Um, so I do some pro bono cooperative consulting and I was working with this uh, women led women, all, all women of all types um, cleaning company, uh, mostly Latinas, but um, the, the owners, white woman. And um she was talking to me about how she, they, they had originally reached out to a um, one of these. I'm not going to say which one, but there's a nonprofit that helps start kind of anchor institution based worker co-ops. And she said that they had worked with them. And these people were so domineering and top down and um, uh, kind of oppressive in their um, uh, approach that they just it, all the workers just like this. They just really recoiled and it was only through accidentally w meeting me through something else that i was saying hey i'll talk to you guys about it and then after going to their first meeting they said wow we didn't get any of this information in the two years we've worked with this other organization because they never met us as workers they were talking to us as like you know we're gonna help you get this started which by the way this organization has had zero successful uh anchor led uh, cooperatives. They've, they, if you look at any of their examples and this is mm -hmm. in my, I have a similar opinion about evergreen. They're all for show. Yeah. I mean, I remember at, uh, going to the U S conference, um, the Federation conference mm -hmm. where the evergreen guy was there, par you know, parading around this dude from evergreen who was like, what the hell is happening? Like th that is not the right approach either. And, yeah. um, well, and they've I, demutualized I feel like, one of those. I mean, right, suppose right. co-ops well, is not is yeah, to these yeah it couldn't be demutualized if it wasn't a co-op. But yeah, I, I, right. <laughs> and I, I, I just, okay. I just, I feel like that's the kinds you get. And and look, this speaks somewhat to what the federation is trying to do, which is to replace, um, you know, all these educated white people with folks from the communities are trying to help. But the reality is, we're trying to help all communities, and also those educated white people occasionally have decades of experience in cooperative management and. 
as Rebecca points out in the article, you lose all of that. If you don't have a, a contingency, if you don't have a, 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 pa a way of keeping that going. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I just don't really have a positive outlook for the future. I don't see new co-ops. When I talk to even my progressive friends who could theoretically work for a co-op instead, they, they don't get it. On a fundamental mm. level, they don't get it. And so who, who who is responsibility is that? Is that the responsibility of the American culture as a whole? Is that an educational thing? I don't know. But I do think that the U.S. Federation's primary goal should be it, to educate people on cooperatives and make sure that they know they are an option. Like what it is, how to do it. And I do not believe the Federation succeeded in that extent, nor do I think um, it succeeded, succeeded in its other stated goals. So uh, again, to well. me... 20 years yeah. says, yeah. I mean, for better or for worse, though, it is, uh, I mean, it is a membership organization. Even if we're only 10% providing 10% of the funding without the members, there's no organization. So for me, like, I do kind of want to put a good portion of the um, accountability, I guess, needs to, I think, needs to fall on the membership. And it was like, we we're the ones who have let it get to this point. And if we don't like it, we need to do something about it. If we don't do anything about it, well, then, you know. But the membership would have to, <laughs> basically, the only means you have is what, to replace the board, which is terrified of the ED. Like, I don't know what this, right. I, to, I me, mean, to me, it's like, it's all bundled into this grant cycle, nonprofit industrial complex. I, I don't see it as ex escapable, personally. But, um, but every I, step along, but it didn't start out this way. And there was a right. series of steps and a progression and it wasn't stopped. Like none of us stepped up and did enough to stop it before it progressed. If, you know, if we didn't like it so much, maybe yeah. we should have done more. Well, earlier. in fairness, people are working and it's the jobs of the people who actually work for the Federation <laughs> to inform us uh, of these things and how well they're right. doing at achieving their state admission. I mean, here's the thing. I don't think it should exist in its current form at all. I think if you look at other trade groups and how they're financed, what's happening with them, they are, it doesn't work this way. I just don't right. feel like a, a nonprofit means, I, I, I don't see that as the way to go. I think it needs to be 100% layer member driven, mayor member supported. It's the only way to, avoid these kinds of consequences and then of course accountability systems but again i haven't been disconnected from it for so long that i probably can't speak on it intelligently beyond that well yeah i mean we've been a member the whole time and i will say that i don't really recall ever seeing any serious effort to survey the members as to what they think the federation should be focused on it's usually you know we're told what the federation is doing we're maybe asked to sign off on something, but it's more presented as a fiat accompli, and it's not like there's really, um, it seems like an easy way for there to, you know, be discussion or anything meaningful discussion among the membership. So, yeah, um, but at any rate, I guess it's, uh, it's, th there can't be any accountability if nobody's, you know, willing to talk about things, you know, and actually, and, and so I, you know, I think, you know, part of what I personally hope that we can accomplish is like, maybe this will spur some action if there's, you know, at least some, some people, you know, bringing it up. Maybe not though. Um, I mean, my understanding is that the Federation, Rebecca sat down with uh, Ricardo and, and mm -hmm. uh, who's, you know, not the ED, but uh, higher up and, the board and for a while. A, right, right. And, but someone who with some power and they talked to her, I don't know what happened. I have no idea. Um, uh, I'm curious to see if that leads to a change. I don't believe it can. I don't think the current structure in, in I mean, without fully cleaning house and then also somehow changing their funding model, I just don't see it changing. Um, uh, but I, I, again, I think with people like Rebecca fighting for what is right, I do think it will make a difference. And I'm keen to hear uh, what comes next. Um, I still feel mm -hmm. like, you know, we're, we're fighting an uphill battle, even if the Federation was not problematic in the way that I see it. Uh, American culture is sort of diseased in a way and just does not compute cooperative stuff. It's just not part of who we are. We're not against it, but it's something that we, I mean, nobody knows what the fuck it is. Like, I, I, you know, they know what food co-ops are, mm -hmm. right? They might know what farmer co-ops are. They have no goddamn idea what a worker cooperative is. And yeah, that is not wholly the Federation's fault, but that to me should be their number one priority is, do you know what this is? Like, mm -hmm. you know, and, and to me, um, 
they don't. You know, America right. is just totally we're going in the opposite direction, you know, so. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it's, you know, it, I think you're right. We're in such a great position to be able to speak to such a wide swath of the American public because we're based around um, democracy and ownership. Like mm -hmm. two things that are fundamental really to being yeah. an American, right? <laughs> it's yeah. like everybody's yeah. on board with democracy and ownership. And, um, you know, we, you know, yeah, we don't, um, seems like, yeah, we, there's not nearly enough focus on that. And, but when I walk through like the grocery store with my U.S. Federation shirt on that says, think outside the boss. I have that one slogan, too. By the way, it's almost, it's almost outside. It's almost, it's so full of holes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, in, invariably, so, you know, somebody's stocking the shelves or something we'll see and be like, oh, right on, man. Cool. Like yeah. people are ready for it, but we do, you know, the, the yeah, who's going out there and and letting them know and and then you know we're co uh, moderators, I suppose, of the the Reddit co ops group, mm -hmm. uh, and um, you know it's the same as you know same kind of questions over and over and over yeah. and over again. And uh, almost no actual. I want to start a co op. There. What do I you know where do I go to yeah. find information? And it's like yeah. it's sad that you have to you end up at a Reddit group. Right, right for that you should right. like you would think that that should that, like should be super easy to find <laughs> yeah i mean already i mean it's like when i started modding that sub it had 400 members and that number has really grown but again mm -hmm. it's kind of just the same new questions over and over again without that much discussion or input from people like me and you who actually are working at cooperatives um and, and that's that's frustrating you know and I, I i run into opportunities all the time to talk about it i never lose a chance to talk about it um people are interested but i just don't feel like it seems like a real possibility in their minds it has almost no media presence it has uh oh, really it's only understood by like left-wing academics and people who work mm -hmm. at food co-ops you know it's not it's not right. most people will they you know if i go to rei and they ask me to join the co-op and i say oh do you know about worker cooperatives no idea largest yeah. consumer co-op in the country no idea you know and right um, yeah, ditto credit unions often, you know. Oh, even, credit and, unions are opposed to us in many cases. We tried to work with credit unions time and time again, and their structure mm -hmm. doesn't even allow. In fact, they weren't even allowed to lend to businesses until recently, you know. So, like, it, yeah, yeah. It, yeah Lower East Side it, it, people had to go and get their like a special dispensation to be able to do that. You right. Know? And now, now it's easier and a lot of them do it, but they still like, well, we are going to require signatures for all the owners. How does that work? How, how do you divide up the share? You know, it's just the same kind of like not understanding what we are. So we work with Chase bank who doesn't give a shit, you know? Right. Uh, <laughs> it's like, I, so I, ironic. Yeah. Ah, anyways, on that note. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, yeah, no, it's been great talking. Um, thanks for your, you know, your, your input on all this stuff and for sharing your story, especially about uh, tech collective. Hopefully that will inspire uh, some people to uh, start one up themselves or to start thinking about that. That um, would be my best and greatest hope. So uh, are there any, um, in, in any places you want to direct people to find out more information or about your business or anything I like mean, that? I mean, techcollective.com is for our business. It's for, that's our main page. Um, uh, I don't know if they want to, I've been interviewed a couple of times, but I'm sure there's other people more interesting. Um, if, if you do get my colleague Jeff on, I'm, I'm keen to hear his experience because he's been doing this longer than me and he mm -hmm. tends to be more forgiving. So I'm, I'm curious to yeah, hear yeah. Her, his perspective <laughs> from you. Uh, he from has this. expressed interest. So hopefully we'll yeah. get him on yeah. sooner. Yeah. He, 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 it's funny. This is the classic. He texted me about 10 minutes ago saying, let me know when you're done. I want to know how it goes, but also I need to talk to you about, and he lists all this work stuff. <laughs> like, all right. All right. Cool. 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 Um, um, yeah. Well, hopefully we'll get a good report back from you uh, and he'll, he'll want to come on. Um, I'll maybe I'll ping him uh, directly. Yeah. I'll tell him to, I'll tell him. No, he'll, he'll come. Up. I'll make um, him do it. Yeah. Great. And it, you know, this is really what geo we always try to be is a platform for practitioners to say whatever, share whatever information, you know, yeah. it's like, we're trying to be the stage and the microphone for other people. And um, it can sometimes be difficult, you know, it can often be difficult to get folks to, yeah. you know, take yeah, some time to off. Yeah, to say things. Job. I mean, hey, look, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm also not, like I, if I was like 
trying to get somewhere in the Federation, I would care, but I just don't. So I'm just, yeah. I'll tell you what my opinion is. Um, I'd love to hear Rebecca on here for what it's worth. Um, yes, she, uh, she will, she will be on eventually. I'm sure. That'd be awesome. uh, she's that another be one awesome. who it's hard to get uh, work into her schedule. Yeah. But. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for all the work that you do and what Geo does. I really appreciate it. I know a lot of people like old school, I, uh, you know, co-op people I know from back in the day who still tell me that the geo is the only place they can really read about co-op stuff, which is saying wow. something actually. Yeah. Um, I have a Google alert for 20 years now that tells me when the word worker ownership appears anywhere on any news source. And I get, I get two or three hits a day or whatever. And geo is usually one of those, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, um, but, uh, you know, once in a while, I'll get some weird one from outside the U.S. that's using the word cooperative very loosely. But Geo mm -hmm. is really the place. So I appreciate it. Great. Um, yeah, that's much appreciated. And thank you for your time. And I will let you go and thank you. work with Jeffrey. <laughs>